Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm uh, talking to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota. My name is Cam Gordon, and I'm a city council member here, uh, Green Party city council member, the only one on our city council of 13 people here in Minneapolis. And it's my honor and privilege to be able to address you and talk to you this evening. Um, I've been on the Minneapolis city council since uh, 2006. And I think I've demonstrated how I can make a difference in how the Greens with our value oriented platform and approach can demonstrate how we can govern in a good way. I'm sure many of you have heard about Minneapolis, Minnesota recently, and I just want to acknowledge um, how it's been a difficult year for a lot of us, in fact, throughout the country and throughout the world, especially with the pandemic, but also locally here, um, we have George Floyd who was murdered, and then we had civil unrest that followed. If you've been following that case, you probably saw how hard that was here. We've been through significant trauma in our community. Since then, there was another black man who was killed by police in a nearby suburb, Brooklyn Center, um, and that's been traumatic for us too. Just demonstrates, I think, um, how long we have to go before we really come to full justice. I'll acknowledge that we, we had the trial here of Derek Chauvin, the former police officer who killed George Floyd, and he was convicted on all accounts. And I will say that created a great relief for the city here to have that sense of justice. Uh, but I am pushing hard to make sure that we remember uh, we need to keep away from going back to the status quo. We've seen in our country over and over again, and in our state and in our city, how we can rise up and we can have a response to some of these injustices but what we really need to do is stay with it for the long term so we can have those bigger impacts. And I just want to express my thanks to everyone out there in the world, because I can say that Minneapolis hasn't felt like we're alone. Um, we felt like there was eyes on us, um, but there was also hearts with us and supporting us and feeling our trauma. We've gotten emails, reports, uh, phone calls, um, outreach, from across the globe of um, how we might be helped, um, ideas that we could use as we're trying to transform our public safety system here. And I really appreciate that. All the well wishes, um, all the good thoughts you know, that have been sent our way. And I'm grateful for that. Um, also, all the expectations that have been raised. I think right now we have a unique opportunity for us to rise to those expectations and maybe help as a city lead the way to figure out what we can do to take these next steps forward. And I'm hoping to do that in my small role as a city council member to bring the Green Party values forward to do that for the city. I have been absolutely honored and privileged to do that for a number of years. And one of the things that I um, really wanted to do was demonstrate how we could take our values of social and economic justice, grassroots democracy, peace and nonviolence, and ecological wisdom and demonstrate how we can use those values to make a difference in, in the city and a difference in the world. Um, and it's quite a challenge to be um, taking on something like a city government. Um, I don't know how many of you out there are active and working in your community, in your neighborhoods, on a board, uh, in an elected office out there, but there's a system that's been put in place for years and for decades and meeting that system and trying to make change is very challenging, but it can be done. Uh, and I think we've made progress in the city of Minneapolis, and I think we're going to be making more progress moving on into the future. And maybe I can share some examples of some of the inroads that we've made, and even we've made some in the area of public safety already. When I um, first got elected, I wanted us to be able to look at violence as something that we could prevent, and we had already started looking at it as a public health issue. Uh, we developed a youth violence prevention plan, and we started looking at how can we have a long-term approach rather than just dealing with things um, after there's a problem already, um, and how can we prevent that upstream? And I think that people across the world, and a lot of you are realizing that's really the way we need to do it. What are the root causes of the violence and problems, and how can we have prevention set up so that we can learn and understand how to resolve our conflicts peacefully, how we can make sure that people have enough resources and enough of a nurturing environment so they don't resort to violence, not to, to 
solve problems or, or to survive um, and, and don't resort to crime and criminal activity and those kinds of things. And how can we do that? So we've invested in that um, and we've done that. And now we have an Office of Violence Prevention in the city of Minneapolis. Some of the steps we've already taken to transform our public safety system have kind of hinged on that vision and that view. Um, we are investing now in a um, fourth response, I'm calling it, to 911 and emergency calls so that there isn't necessarily a police response to every issue. We already have three responses that we've used traditionally, fire, police, and paramedics. And maybe paramedics actually is a good example because we weren't doing that in the 60s. It used to be police who would take people to the hospital. Now, they'd have a heart attack, they'd have a medical emergency, and they would be put in the back of a police car and taken to the hospital. Well, we started to see emergency room doctors saying, well, this might not be a good idea. We're getting people coming in here who are hurt and didn't get the help they needed and, and it hasn't handled well. And we made a big transition in the 60s and the 70s to getting paramedics in all of our cities. So there's an ambulance response. There's emerg emergency medical technicians who can care for people and get them to the emergency room in the hospital. And now we're working in Minneapolis on a crisis, a behavioral or mental health crisis response team that doesn't include uh, police officers. And maybe it includes paramedics, but maybe it doesn't necessarily have to because we believe there's situations that we can have a response to and an intervention to that um, can de-escalate those, especially if there's a behavioral crisis. Uh, and so we'll be rolling that out this summer. And I'm um, very excited about seeing how that might work and how that might prevent some of the tragedies that we've seen in our city when all we have is a police response to some of those crises. Uh, and I think we've seen some promising results and I will thank those other cities and others who've sent in ideas about this and how we can do that. And I'm looking forward to moving forward on that. Uh, I think I also wanna talk a little bit about Minneapolis and how we've led in some other areas as well. I wanted to talk about um, voting in Minneapolis this is a little different than in a lot of cities. And in large part, because the Greens were very involved early on years ago, looking at how can we change our voting system to make sure that it's better. Um, if you've run as a Green before, or you've campaigned for Greens, you probably hear about, oh, you're just gonna take votes away from so-and-so. A lot of times we go in and vote and we're voting for the lesser of two evils. We find people who are afraid to vote for the alternative party or somebody who's out there because their vote will be wasted. Well, in Minneapolis, we pushed hard to get an instant runoff voting or what um, was commonly called now ranked choice voting passed. And it really took Greens being involved in that at the beginning and then building coalitions with others to get that passed in Minnesota. Um, I was part of a group that started Fair Vote Minnesota, which really pushed that. And once I was elected, it's when we were starting to implement that because the ballot measure was, was put forward and then the council decided that they would vote and change our ordinances to allow ranked choice voting. And then we needed to implement it. And I was um, honored to be there at the ground level when we were pushing that forward, setting our rules and our protocols in, up so that we could do those elections. And we have had um, successful ranked choice voting elections in our city. And actually, I'm delighted to see that St. Paul has adopted it and it's spreading in Minnesota. And every so often we get a pushback from the legislature, like right now, saying maybe we, they, the state doesn't want to allow um, cities to do that. I think we're going to fend that off though, and we're going to be able to keep implementing our ranked choice voting, which has really improved elections, opened it up, and hopefully someday we can add proportional representation into our elections in the city, and we can look about how we can have more diversity on the council in that way. I also think it's really important that we open things up to public financing. Um, I think we're really um, in trouble sometimes when we rely on public, uh, I mean, sorry, private um, funding for all of our elections. We see the um, moneyed interests that are having great influence. Today is the anniversary of the famous 1886 um, court decision um, in Santa Clara against some railroads that decided um, just kind of in a sentence in that big decision that um, corporations had the rights of people. Uh, and that's been a, set us on a downward trend for a long time and, and led to Citizens United and other decisions that have only made it 
harder for us to get money out of politics and harder for us to get um, corporate influence out. And that is actually one of the key jobs of local government, I think, is challenging the capitalist system and how can we challenge these corporations and make sure that we carve out some kind of just economy um, for the people. And that's, I think, the biggest responsibility, one of the biggest responsibility, of course, we have to protect our planet and we have to preserve um, people's rights, but we also have to push back on the market, the free market. And it's uh, at the city level, you can see that almost every day with development and developers. And often the biggest contributions to campaigns come from developers or people who might have business before the city because you know, they have a business license, a zoning decision, and all of those things. That's why it's been my um, pledge and my commitment to never take money from people with business before the city or anybody who's a known developer in the city. Uh, as a green, I also don't take money from any political action committee. I take it from individuals only. Um, and I think that's helped me be able to push harder for worker protections, worker rights. Minneapolis has been leading in many of those areas. We now um, have a minimum wage in Minneapolis that we passed. Um, we've also got that past uh, the $15 minimum wage. Um, as other cities nearby have seen how successful that is. Um, we've now ramped it up. So people in our city, if you work in the city of Minneapolis, you're paid $15 an hour at least. Um, and this is probably more important than anything else. It's tied to a cost of living increase too. So we don't have to go back and have some other vote and every time we're going to raise that minimum wage, but it's set to go up with cost of living as it increases. And I think that's very, very significant. And I encourage people to do that in their localities as they can. When we first tried to do that at the city level, many people said, that's not a city job. That should be done at the federal level. That should be done at the state level. Well, we hear that a lot and um, we see where that gets us sometimes. And we've actually discovered here in Minnesota that if you start at the local level, just like ranked choice voting, and now just like the minimum wage increase, that and if it works and you can pilot it at a city, and we happen to be the biggest city in the state, so it makes kind of um, gets noticed and see how that works. And then others say, hey, maybe that can work, or hey, that was really popular with people. I think I want to push that in my uh, locality. Let's see if we can't move that forward. So that's really si significant. And I will tell you that as uh, a Green, having a social and economic justice core to my values um, and trying to implement them. Finding something like a minimum wage increase um, coming forward and being supported, it's easy for me to champion that. And that's actually one of the strategies that works best. Um, keep the values in mind, see where there's momentum going forward, and then be the insider in City Hall who can push that forward and make a difference. It's been very significant. We've also done some things with um, wage theft and how we're challenging that. Now we're trying to look at how can we protect independent contractors and work with those and, and, and others in there. I think we're still going to have to move forward on a um, fair scheduling ordinance because we still have abuses all over the place with that. And we do have a safe and sick time ordinance so that people are protected and so that they can have time off when they work in the city. It actually is working well for employers and employees because it makes Minneapolis a better place to come and work in. We've also got a really big problem in Minneapolis with racial disparities. Uh, and I know we're not the only city that has that, but we are one of the worst when it comes to uh, many disparities. We have a large indigenous population in our city. Um, we have a, a growing black population in our city, lots of immigrants coming in our city. And we have big disparities in terms of employment, in terms of wealth, in terms of success uh, in school, you know, even life expectancy. And so that's something that I've really been attacking hard as a Green, walking in the door saying we need to make sure to address that. Um, now um, we have a division of race and equity um, that we didn't have before. We have staff investments in that. And this year we're starting a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and we're going to be looking at that. And I think that's actually opening the door for a reparation system in the city of Minneapolis so we can really try to correct some of these historical harms and injustices that have seeped into every facet, obviously, into our criminal justice system. And we are digging into that um, deeply, as I mentioned before. We've been looking at things like, and I hope everybody is out there, like traffic stops and seeing how there's a disparity in who gets stopped. There's a disparity in who gets searched. There's a disparity in who gets um, 
arrested and charged. There's a disparity in who gets convicted, um, and we need to seriously look in, at that. The um, historic way of policing with uh, over-policing certain parts of the community uh, and using the broken window system has failed us. Um, and as the Green, I've seen that, and we've tried to repeal some of our low-level offenses just because of that. A uh, classic example we had in our city was a, a law against um, lurking, um, which is a very vague law. We were able to repeal that. That's just some of the work that we're doing. I have to say we have some challenges in the housing uh, area. We've been investing more and more in affordable housing, but we have to do more and we have to do more with public housing so it reaches those people who need it most. We also are facing an incredible opioid crisis, as many people are, I'm sure, and many urban areas are in our city and we're trying to tackle that too. Last thing I sort of want to mention a little bit with, in terms of the green values um, is environmental sustainability. And a lot of times because greens get pegged with that's all we care about, it's not necessarily the first thing that I like to talk about, but it is critically important. And we are poised in our city right now, I think to make significant and dramatic changes and have a Minneapolis Green New Deal coming forward. Um, we tried to municipalize our utility companies um, we got close and we may finish that soon, but in the process of doing that, we really raised a great deal of awareness. Uh, people in Minneapolis now understand that climate change is a crisis and an emergency. We declared it a public health emergency um, and we are looking at that. We have identified a social cost of carbon and we are making preparations so that we are, will be charging a higher franchise fee for fossil fuels than others. We have a pollution tax that we've been implementing. We already have a green cost sharing program we're talking about where I'm, and implementing where we have funds that we've got from our franchise agreement and our um, pollution fees that we are able to charge in our state so that we can invest in, in clean energy initiatives and, and help uh, share the costs for property owners, for apartment buildings, so that we can make those improvements. We're moving forward with inclusive financing proposal and we are going to tie those investments back to environmental justice issues. We've identified green zones in our city and that's where we're making our biggest investments so that we can repair some of those harms that were done in the past in terms of where the most polluted parts of our city are and where people have suffered the most uh, from environmental degradation. Um, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about getting to continue serving on the city council. We are running a hard campaign now as we're moving forward and we could really use some help and support out there. And that's one of the reasons why um, I'm here uh, broadcasting this out to all of you um, and working closely with Greens at the, at the state and at the national level um, is to get a little bit of support so we can keep building our campaign here in Minneapolis. Um, I have challengers this year um, more than I've had before. Um, when I won in 2005, it was against a um, major party endorsed candidate, and we won by less than 200 votes. Um, so we have close elections here. I've been successful, and I've been reelected for my fourth term. Um, but now there's three challengers who are running active campaigns against me, and I could use your support. So I encourage you to um, learn more about the campaign. I actually welcome people to reach out to me anytime they want from anywhere. You can contact me uh, from on my phone, my cell phone, 612-296-0579. You can send me an email, cam at camgordon.org. Um, you can certainly use our website to connect with our campaign. Um, I've already got a Sierra Club endorsement. I'm endorsed by the local Green Party. It was the first endorsement I, I, I went for and was honored to get that again, as I have every time I've run. I've got a labor endorsement now and we're building the campaign. Um, we're getting out at the doors uh, several times a week. And I think the most important thing you can do as, as a candidate is get out and talk to people yourself. I'm trying to do that several times a week. Um, and it's very helpful, very uh, informative. Um, and I want to um, welcome you to join this campaign. As I mentioned earlier, I don't take money from PACs. I don't take money from developers. So I do rely on individual contributions. Uh, really makes a difference. Most of those come from the locality here, but we welcome support um, from across the country. Um, we can use support um, even in this day and age, sometimes with volunteers. So there's an opportunity to volunteer where we're going to do some phoning and we're going to explore um, how can we share that and have support elsewhere. I think this is a seat um, in, for Greens that we'll want to keep 
that are green, hopefully get more greens elected to the Minneapolis City Council and certainly hold the seat that we have so we can keep being a model. It is one of um, my great honors and privilege to be a Green Party elected official uh, in, in this country. I think this is a time when we can really lead and we can really make a difference. And I think it's important to remember it's not just what we do, but it's also how we do it as Greens. Um, one of the Green Party values maybe we don't um, talk about enough is respect for diversity. I mean, I will tell you um, feminism, respect for diversity, grassroots democracy, you know, nonviolence, those things can inform us as much on how we should be behaving as, as much as they can with what we should be moving forward as policy. Um, and I think it's really important um, that we listen to one another if we're gonna really respect diversity. I mean, biodiversity is really important, but I believe it's really important that we also acknowledge there's political diversity. I can't be an effective representative if I don't listen to all the people in my ward and understand where they're coming from and realize that by listening to that diversity and understanding it and then using it to build consensus so that we can take steps forward together, I'm not gonna be effective. In fact, I believe that I have an obligation to listen to those and try to be that voice in City Hall. It works really well for me because I believe the green value, values that I have and the Green Party has are shared by my constituents by and large. And oftentimes it's really easy to know where the consensus is because if you talk to people and you understand and they want to do the right thing and they want to have a healthy environment and they want justice and they believe in peace so we can take steps easily. But sometimes it gets more complicated and difficult and we need to listen and also listen to each other. And I'll just put that out there. I think even within the Green Party, we have to do that and understand. And we've been um, very good in Minnesota, I think, to realize that we want to be con seeking consensus, appreciating our diversity, and realizing that by hearing the differences of opinions, we can actually build something that sometimes and is often better. So I want to demonstrate not just that we can move the Green Party agenda forward, but we can also change the way the government works and even the community works so that we are working together, that we are taking steps forward together to make this a better world for everybody. You know, I welcome your support and your involvement in my campaign. Um, and I also welcome the opportunity um, if people would like to reach out to me to talk more individually about maybe how I could help support what you're doing throughout the country or wherever you live um, to build the party and to help make this a better world for everybody. I really appreciate your time this evening. I hope everybody is doing well. Um, I'm really glad that I got the vaccination. I hope that we all can, and we can see us rebuild and recover better than ever from this pandemic, and also better than ever from the historic uh, institutionalized injustices and racism that we have in our country, um, so that we can make this a better place for everybody, and also a better place for generations to come as we tackle the horrendous crisis of climate change. Thank you so much for listening. I wish you all the best. Be well and take care.